Good morning and welcome to Moments with Melinda. I am your host, Melinda Moulton. And today, my guest is Cami Davis. How are you, my friend? I'm great. I'm loving watching the trees leaf out every moment, soaking it up. Today is the day, but we're going to get into that because there's also probably a little bit of concern in your mind as well, which we're going to talk about. But let me share with my viewers a little bit about your illustrious and amazing career. Cami Davis has attended artist residencies at the Vermont Studio Center and Banff Center for the Arts in Alberta, Canada, and has exhibited throughout Vermont, New York, and San Diego. Her work is in private and public collections nationally. She is the recipient of the Lee Krasner Jackson Pollock Foundation grant for painting, as well as grants from both the Argosy and Puffin Foundations for painting in collaboration with composer Sam Guarnaccio. Her paintings, installations, and community art projects have followed the climate change movement for the last decade. She is interested in the role perception plays in understanding the human nature relationships and considers studio practice to be her fundamental means to navigate life in a warming world. Davis is a member of the International Eco Art Network.org and WEAD, the Women Environmental Artist Directory. She is a senior lecturer in the Department of Art and Art History, and I believe also in the Environmental Studies Program at the University of Vermont. Did I get that right? Almost. Almost. I am just, as, as of Tuesday, receiving my emerita status. I have retired from teaching um, after 34 years at, with the Department of Art and Art History at UVM, and I'm thrilled to actually have emerita status to continue relationships there. Um, but yeah, I have moved away. I've been on sabbatical this last year. So May last a year ago, May was my last teaching, which is huge, huge transition. It is huge. But now you have this wonderful world to yes. go out and do your great work. So let's, Cami, let's start at the beginning. Um, okay. I was born. No. Yeah, no, seriously. I, I, you know, I always want my viewers to understand the people that I'm, that I'm talking to. And, and as a friend, I would love it if you'd share with my viewers a little bit about growing up. Where did you grow up? And tell us a little bit about your childhood. Oh, wow. Um, I was born in, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I was born in Connecticut. And when I was five years old, I moved to Troy, New York. Um, I was, my father uh, had gone to RPI and had an opportunity to, he was an uh, anesthesiologist and had an opportunity to return to his alma mater and, um, and he was thrilled. My mother was less thrilled. She became, eventually she left Troy. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, and Troy right now is very exciting arts center. But anyways, uh, yeah. And I would say one of the biggest influences was, and it's something that you may not know, Melinda, like your granddaughters, um, I was a ski racer, a downhill ski racer. So that brought me to Vermont, uh, all over New England, and then eventually all over the country um, through the Can-Am series, um, which is now, I believe, called Norams. But anyways, the uh, the National B team and then the top regional skiers. So mountains, hiking, skiing were very influential. And um, yeah, and I would say and still. Had, and you had a knee, you had issues with your knees and you gave you gave up the racing. Yes. Uh, you were also a coach at Green Mountain Valley School. And so do you still ski? Do you ever get out and get up on the mountain or cross country? Do you, do you well, still play? Um, I am going in for a total knee replacement May 8th with the goal to get back up on that mountain. So I'm really psyched about when that. When you do, will you give me a call and we'll do a few runs at Mad River. I'd yes. love to spend a day with you. Yes, and, I would love to do that. And also let me know if you need um, if you need any chicken soup or anything in, in your recovery, because you know I, I'm always there for you. Um, Thank you. So at what point in your life did you realize that you wanted to be an artist? <laughs> um, you know, I, I was always doing kind of arts and crafts kinds of things. I was always making, um, always, 
uh, and I wouldn't say I was the art star, say in elementary school, um, but in high school we had, I went to a girl's school and we had something equivalent to a January term and I did choose painting and I painted a mountain. <laughs> so um, I would say in high school, by college, um, I was really torn between you had to choose and yet I sensed, I knew that there was a relationship but I had to choose between environmental studies or studio art. And uh, I ended up choosing studio art. But that that burr in my side of going, wait a minute, I intuit that there's a relationship here and trying to articulate what that relationship is was a really great burr that uh, I think has propelled my thought process around my studio practice um, to this day. That's always evolving, you know, how I how I see that human nature relationship. Well, let's talk about that for a second in the painting that's right behind you. This is a Debbie prayer. Um, talk to us a little bit about your beautiful painting that's that's behind you. So Debbie prayer um, started um, with noticing um, the apple blossoms in my neighborhood and, um, and my concern about the honeybee collapse and there's uh so it started with these images of apple blossoms but it, and then they're actually you can't see but they're little diagrams of the honeybee waggle dance um uh also on the painting they're really um and uh oh it took three years to make this painting and so over the course of the painting um those apple blossoms became different things in my association i i think of uh the practice I think of a painting itself as being an ecosystem in the sense that there are concepts, associations, intuitions, embodied responses. Um, so it's it's a, a series of relationships. So there was time, there were times when those apple blossoms became um the lotus of Buddhism or the what and then the white rose of um mystic Christianity. Um these are not necessarily things that I am actually thinking about any longer, but um, so they do reflect a kind of all the work reflects uh, a dialogue between inside and outside perception that there's the phenomenon of those blossoms, what they look like, the representational part of that. But there also there's this invisible realm or this um, felt realm, this subjectivity and I'm always kind of thinking about the integration, really, of objectivity and subjectivity as as being what is whole. And and but at a, at a young age, um, you talk to us a little bit about that the emergence of the environment into your work, into your creative work, and what inspired that focus for you back in the 1990s, which took you to the Schumacher College and the International Institute of Ecological Studies in Devon, England. What, what yeah. was that spark? That so um, again, mountains were really big in my life in terms of skiing, in terms of hiking. I worked with um, the Appalachian Mountain Club in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. You know, I chose to go to an artist residency in the Canadian Rockies and in, in Banff. And I would say that the work has always been curious about a sensed presence in nature. And so it, it took this arc really of notions of the sublime in nature, something greater, larger than us, even terror, you know, these kind of characteristics of the sublime. The work very quickly became what's called non-objective. It was very geometric, but I'm thinking about the presence and they, they were big canvases. They had burnished metal and paint and oil paint and um, trying to get that sort of metallic fleck of the rocks above timberline. And um, and so I, I was interested in those states of awe um, in the studio practice. What happened in 1998 is I went and studied at Schumacher College with James Hillman, the Jungian psychologist, and the, the title of that course was Inside Outside Perception, Psychology, Ecology, and Art. And it was, it was as if I opened my eyes for the first time after 25 years of painting, again, what's called non-objectively. There, there weren't any pictures of anything that's recognizable. 
And um, I'm still, I was still trying to incorporate internal felt form of my sense of uh, this presence, this ever kind of abiding presence, um, uh, while also beginning to include um, recognizable imagery. Um, and, and I'm still in that place that started. So after, again, after painting for 25 years, one way I shifted, it was such a profound uh, course at Schumacher. Um, and ever since I've been playing with that dialogue between what's recognizable, what's not. And I've come to additional ways of thinking about the process itself, improvisation itself, as reflecting the way life works. Um, Nora Bateson, the daughter of Gregory Bateson, talks about um, in nature and in art, what you have are these multiple levels of communication that happen simultaneously. So that's similar to when I was saying that idea is so you have concepts, you have associations, you have felt form, you have um, uh, in the moment responses, uh, embodied responses. Um, you, you can feel rhythms and and all of these multiple levels happen at the same time. And so the process itself of improvisation to me is the process of life. It's It's the same, even if there wasn't recognizable imagery. It's fascinating. So do you believe that art defines our, that art defines civilization? Mm. Um, I don't um, I don't know about that um, as in terms of define, but I would say that I would I would actually kind of reverse it in a sense of that we are situated within life because we have co-evolved with the rest of life. And um, and those notions of when I look at the stars, I'm I'm my I am the universe reflecting on the universe. We're not the only species. Uh, apparently, uh, crows do that, and there are other species that have this self-reflective um, capacity. Um, I I think a lot about particularly with the work with um, Sam Granacha, Paula Granacha, his creative partner and wife, and John Chimino, the educator aspect of this Emergent Universe Oratorio project. I think a lot about um, are we different or not than the rest of life? Um, and certainly uh, am resistant to any sort of um, hierarchy or elevation. Um, hubris of of us thinking that we're we're better or different because of certain uh capacities but humans but humans do yes yes do yeah yeah i mean the bower bird do you know about the bower bird who does um loves to make um homes out of blue things it finds it'll find plastic trash it'll find blue flowers it'll make these incredible creations um, and of course we can explain that away. Oh, it's just, you know, like the peacock trying to, uh, attract a mate, but the amount of creativity that goes into that is extraordinary. And you can't help but think that there's, there's also appreciation for those architects. You know, <laughs> those well, I, I've been also, I've been also studying probably not to the degree that you do trees. Absolutely. And, and I have trees on in my yard who create art the way yes. that they, they their branches reach out and touch other trees and they create art amongst themselves and i've watched this for 53 years about how yes. they create their own art and yes. how to position themselves to create this extraordinary beauty um no we yes. we are we have we have so much to learn as human beings from yes. around us and that's why your art is so powerful and important cami so as an artist, and you may have touched on this, you have taken your creative works and merged the visual with your voice. Your paintings are just one part of your creative works. Talk to us about your exhibitions that have focused so profoundly on the fate of our species on this planet, because you, your work has a voice. It's not just you put the work up and it's a pretty picture of a sunset over Lake Champlain or 
or some landscape, you, you three years you worked on the painting that's behind you. You have a voice, you speak with that. Talk to us a little bit about that. Well, as you asked that question, the first one that came to my, the, the exhibit that came to mind is, um, oh gosh, I think it was of land and local at Burlington City Arts. And um, that was a group exhibition which I love group exhibitions. Um, I love having when you because th I'm thinking with voice, it's it's a much as much about the creative act of curating um, these themes or concepts of relationships between groups of artists, and that in itself um, is, as I say, both creative but also has a voice. The curation. Um, I am interested in the ideas. Um, that can then happen. I am interested when you get to talk about work and particularly at panels of artists whose ideas are, um, I mean, yes, an art object is also thought of as being irreducible, that it's beyond words, um, but it's also really interesting to try to articulate what's going on in the work and then share that um, like in a community of artists. And that particular exhibit, um, of land and local, um, I did a series called Airs, Waters, Soils, Places. And it was a combination of paintings, yeah. And it was a combination of, um, first of all, I'm riffing the title, I'm riffing off of Hippocrates, Airs, Soils, Places, who way back then was saying, we need to have clean waters and clean air um, in order to have healthy places. Um, so there were paintings, but there were also these jars which took water samples and plant samples and macroinvertebrates from all the tributaries, not all, a number of tributaries in Lake Champlain and then Lake Champlain. Um, and etched on those jars were um, the invasive species that are starting to um, affect the, the health of Lake Champlain. So in that way, it has a voice. There's this concept, there's this form of activism really um, in a very overt way. Um, my more recent exhibition, Poetic Ecologies, is, is less um, overt, but still a voice in the sense of um, this perceptual sense of understanding where does the subjectivity, where, um, you know, that subjectivity is also needing to be at the table, that it's not just our practical solutions um, to create a flourishing uh, world, but we know that the facts alone have not been enough. And it's really, um, uh, it's really an evolution of love, uh, love for each other and love for our, this home earth um, that I, I think is going to bring us together. I mean, give us any possibility of, of being able to go forward. Um, so I've been grappling with, um, is it okay to be that heart-centered <laughs> in the work without it being as overtly um, activist? Um, but I think, that's that's where a lot of the energy is right now is finding frameworks, uh, readings on um, on ecology and thought that support that. And there are different entries into that. One is the emergent universe oratorio, this this idea of our coevolution and where we're situated as humans within all of life. Another would be indigenous thought. Another would be um, um, they're, they're different writers who talk, uh, Jeremy Lent talks about integrating our animate intelligence with our in intellectual capacity. Um, Vermonter, I just discovered, uh, David Hinton, I always thought he was a West Coast artist, um, poet uh, and translator, um, talks about paleo mind. And so there's this idea of getting in touch with this shared kinship with the rest of life that you can access from different thought frameworks. And yet, but you've been doing this for decades. I, I, I'm going to go back in time for a second here okay. and engage you to discuss the earth. I mean, you've been doing this work for, de for decades. So let's engage you in discussing the earth charter. 
Um, yeah. Talk to us about that and share with us the Arc of Hope, Hope project, which you which you collaborated with many, many people. One in particular who's, who we both love so dearly is Sally Linder. Yes. I remember the culmination event at Shelburne Farms where Jane Goodall spoke and several thousand people came out. Yes. Talk to us a little bit about that project because that was extraordinary. And here you are, uh, two, you know, 20 some years later, yeah. and, and we're still trying to, yeah, trying to hammer it home. Talk to us about that. Yeah. Yeah. So that was definitely one of the big experiences of my life, um, co creating that, co producing it with um, Sally Linder, who was also a painter. Um, and we created a, a, a community arts project called Temenos books, images for global healing, peace, and gratitude. And then Sally um, worked with a carpenter to create this Ark of Hope that looked like the Ark of the Covenant, only it was covered with um, differently abled people and the animals of the world. Um, and, uh, and that was to house these books that were made um, when this international document called the Earth Charter uh, was to go to the UN for endorsement. And the Earth Charter basically was early days of talking about this um, intersectionality of economy, ecology, and justice, and that you need all of those in order to make peace. What year, um, was, this? What year was this, Cammie? So in 1992, um, the Earth Charter tried to get in, um, or th tried to get created at the Rio Earth Summit we it didn't happen so then actually a, a a good and interesting project happened which was that it um uh that it, it then what became more grassroots so instead of being top down un it became uh so many many people at the lead of um stephen rockefeller um who was the chair of the drafting committee um many many people had input um individuals and, and environmental organizations as to basically trying to address a way forward. Um, and uh, I forget your question. Well, you can't, well, you carried the arc. I remember you. Oh, the, right. So, okay. I mean, this was in the night and you, you carried this big. Yeah. Heavy. So, wooden, I believe you carried it. It went so. Uh, so went what happened world, was, right? we, yeah. So let me backtrack a little bit with the Temenos books because there there were thousands of Vermonters who were introduced to the Earth Charter. Were you one? I was one. I feel. I yes, I was. Yeah. And we went to um, we went to fifty schools, and we went to sustainability conferences, and we went to businesses, um, and we introduced them to this remarkable document, and. Um, and then we had them make images. Some people made whole books. Other people just made a page that would then go into artists made books. And then Sally's concept was to then put them into this arc of hope. Um, <clears throat> and um, again, to go down to the UN. So all that was a buildup to the 2001 is when the event at the breeding barn at Shelburne Farms happened. Um, and it was for love of earth, um, a celebration of the earth charter. And I, I also want to credit Sally with that title because, you know, there were all these different, uh, again, more practical or the language of sustainability. And we just look at each other and it's like, yeah, but it's for love, you know. Well, it is for love. And actually, sustainability doesn't even work so much anymore today. Um, it doesn't. It's really adaptability. We have to learn to adapt and do what yeah. we can. So, yeah. So thank you for that, because that was an extraordinary project and really touched. Oh, can I say one more thing? Yes, please do. So, so what happened was there was this huge event at Shelburne Farms. Um, we did a silent pilgrimage walk with Satish Kumar, the um, founder of Resurgence Magazine and Schumacher College in the UK. We had Jane Goodall. We had Paul Winter. We had, you know, um, we're supposed to have Wangari Matai, but she was back in jail. Um, but all the, it was an amazing day of love. Um, we were led in a meditation by a uh, Buddhist ecologist, uh, Stephanie Kaza, and all the participants made an image that then got put into the ark. 
the intent was the ark would then go to the UN when um, the um, Earth Charter was supposed to come up for endorsement. So this was September 9th, 2001. So we all know what happened on September 11th. So what happened was I was in class, but Sally was there with a number of artists cleaning up from this event when the news of um, 9-11 happened. And we had just come on this silent, very short walk from the parking lot to this event with Satish Kumar because he was the world walker for peace uh, decades ago. And she knew in that moment that it was time to walk the ark. Mm -hmm. um, and so it got walked up to Burlington. And then there was a little cart that got made under it, but it got walked all the way down to um, just above New York and it got on the sloop, um, whatever that guy's name is, sorry. <laughs> um, and then sailed into the UN. Wow, magnificent project. Yeah. So we're coming sort of to the end of our yeah. of our of our interview, but I have a couple other questions that I wanted to ask you. Um, as someone who endeavors to make sense of our world, can you help us to make sense of it under the present circumstances of global warming, reproductive justice, the human and natural conditions, and all of the other issues that are facing humanity? Yes, that is the question, isn't it? Um, yeah, that's the constant driver. Um, and I think that's why perhaps there's still, it's, it's like the painting is almost like a reflection of this back to that inside outside perception of um, trying to understand this role of of love in trying to summon and contextualize whatever our solutions are. Um, and it's not solution is the wrong word. Um, whatever we are able to al align, align ourselves so that I love using Janine Benyus, align ourselves with conditions conducive to life. Um, and uh, there's a lot of listening that has to happen for that alignment. And the painting helps me to listen. Um, and this work that I'm doing with the oratorio project that I've returned to um, that first began in 2013, where I did um, paintings at the scale, 14 paintings to go along with the Emergent Universe Oratorio, we spent the pandemic rewriting that libretto. Um, there's seven major choral pieces and then these spoken words in between to more accurately to our understanding reflecting these times, um, both the social and ecological unraveling, and um, much of which needs to unravel to then reweave whatever will flourish. Um, how do we live with not knowing exactly what's going to flourish, what's going to emerge? It's the nature of um, existence is complexity and emergence. Um, but I feel like if we stack the deck with as many behaviors that are in alignment um, with conditions conducive to life, that even what unknowns emerge um, are more likely to, to help us all flourish. So where, where can we hear this oratorio? Where can we? So the oratorio um, is going to be performed by Albany Pro Musica in May, 2025. Um, mm, okay. Uh, most likely at RPI at MPAC, the emergent, uh, no, not emergent, sorry, Experimental Media and Performing Arts Center at RPI. And um, what's additional with this project is we also will um, have a day long symposium or other speakers building up to um, the performance. And what I'm working on, and I'm working with a animator, Will Tipper, who is a uh, Vermont born and raised, but Brooklyn based animator and using assets or the details of the paintings um, in, a, in an 80 minute animation that'll be part, that'll be projected the whole time of the 
the oratorio. That is so exciting. And that's certainly something that I would I would so love to attend and be there for that. So yeah. in closing, Cami, what words of wisdom can you offer our young people today oh. about how they can maneuver in the 21st century and how they can have influence to help guide them in their own futures? Yes. Uh, trust your love. Mm -hmm. Trust. Trust in possibility. Um, trust in, you know, the models of a Greta Thunberg, um, that, that even trust in our, in your collective voice. Or, or Will Tipper. Trust in yeah. the young leaders that are emerging. Yes. Because there, there's so many. Yes. Yeah. You know, I, I think our, our future really is in good hands with the future of humanity because of these extraordinary young people yes helping to guide us well, and you. and have as many embodied experiences as you can <laughs> too Absolutely. um we're all very addicted to our devices myself included it's very true very true so and, consciously um, consciously uh being in the world hopefully we can use that in some ways for good well listen cammy davis extraordinary time half an hour with you i could talk to you for for days um and i want to thank you for everything you've done and everything you're doing and for your leadership in the art world and the environmental consciousness that you're bringing into all of our hearts through your art and through your lectures and your work so thank you for that and, and thank you and to my viewers i want to thank you for your time um today and i want to wish you a beautiful springtime and the apple blossoms will be blooming soon and hopefully all those beautiful bees that Vermont loves to take care of will return very shortly. Thank you yeah. so much, my friend.